you can still invest in very carbon heavy industries, for example, and make very good short term investment money. But I also gave you the example of Bayer, where you can lose this money in a surprising way, because I think most people were not expecting this market outcome. And this is the thing about markets, right? Markets look always into the future and they adapt the future value to the current situation. Walter Link is the CEO and founder of Now Partners, an organization that has created sustainable business networks across Europe and the Americas. Walter has dedicated the last 30 years to creation of an international movement that would inspire and support economies and companies to integrate economic success with regenerating for people and the planet. Hello, you're with Echelon and the founding CEO of Now Partners, Walter Link, is with us in the studio. It's good to have you here with us, Walter. Uh, let me start here, Walter. Uh, the IMF recently forecast that in 2023, about a third of global economies will slip into recession. Uh, interest rates across the world are at historic highs in several regions we see war and uncertainty stemming from the global climate. This seems to be a difficult year, I suppose, to navigate. How is the climate overall and, and the impact it's having on asset markets impacting the agenda that you talk about, a regenerative agenda where people and planet are first? Uh, I don't think that uh, people and planet are first. I think they need to be integrated because uh, if you look at our crises, uh, we have the immediate crises uh, that you described. Mm. We also have a global climate crisis. You know, we just come back from COP27 uh, and uh, the warnings of the scientists around the world and the governments and the United Nations and also many companies are very clear. So it's not anymore a question to be nice. It's a question whether we want to survive as humanity and also as business, because business depends on a healthy society and a healthy climate and a healthy nature. If the context for business is healthy, then also companies uh, can make healthy and sustained uh, success. And I think this is what we need to pursue. So we need to pursue a kind of economic success where the profitability of companies and the economic development become fully integrated with the regeneration of people and nature because we need people and nature for a healthy economy. Sure. If, if you look at the challenging context that you know, the world is in currently, uh, do you, how do you think this agenda is impacted? Is it impacted in a significant way, do you think? Or is that impact kind of short term? In what ways is that impact? I think we, uh, if we look at business success and economic development success, right? You have always short term trends and you have long term trends. Sometimes uh, they are aligned sure. and sometimes they appear contradictory. Let's look at the investment side, right? So when I started, you know, helping to create the sustainability investment and business movements around the world over 30 years ago, uh, what we now call ESG investing was very, very tiny, sure. you know? Now we are talking about a $40 trillion market. So it has hugely expanded. So this is a mega trend that will continue sure. for many years to come. Sure. At the same time, last year, coal and other carbon intensive energies were some of the best asset classes. So how does that fit together? Well, it fits together that sometimes short term trends are contradictory to long term trends. It doesn't take away from the truth of the long term trend, 
But as a company, you need to be successful on the short term, the medium term and the long term. So we cannot just be uh, ideological about it or dogmatic. We have to always stay very close to the market and see what is necessary right now without losing the perspective for the longer term. A, a decade ago, I suppose this would be true that most companies saw shareholder value maximization as their primary and only goal. Uh, like you said, ESG investing has emerged, I think, in the last five years, maybe more, uh, as, as a significant uh, pot of money available for companies serious about their impact on the world. Does, you know, uh, a co corporate leader in Sri Lanka could sit and think, you know, how relevant is that to me? You know, how, how do I tap that, if possible? And how, how, how can I make that relevant to discussions I have with my main share stakeholders, which include the shareholders, a key component of the stakeholders? How, how do you make that relevant? Yeah. So, something very interesting happened a few years ago when the business round table in the United States, which brings together the country's um, biggest companies represented by their CEOs. So this is a, a quite conservative, but also forward-looking business community that keeps in mind the short-term realities and the long-term trends. They said that the era of shareholder value moved into an era of stakeholder values. Why? What, what changed? I think what changed is that these mega trends that are also propelling ESG investing are not only true for investors, but for all stakeholders that are important for companies. If you look at the numbers for clients, whether they are business to business or business to consumer clients, they all have a greater and greater pre preference for more sustainable products. Now, of course, the price has to be good. The quality has to be good. Sustainability is not something separate from overall performance, mm. but it has become a significant component by which companies are evaluated. So, for example, a very successful company like Tesla becomes suddenly much more valuable as the whole German car industry mm. or the whole Japanese car industry. Sure. Why? Because they were integrating um, a high performance with a very positive contribution to the climate crisis and overall sustainability mm. with uh, a very attractive driving experience mm. and a great aesthetic look. Mm. So all the different things that are motivating people to buy cars, not only now in the moment, but in the long term, reflected on the share value of Tesla. Because short term, they were selling very few cars, much fewer cars than the Japanese or German industry. But investors are smart enough to make the extrapolation into the future and to see that this is a solution, not only for driving and mobility, but for storage of energy, for use uh, and efficiency of energy, for less pollution, for less negative climate impact. So a lot of good things came together and that propelled the great value. I can give you a counter example at the stock exchange. Sure. So if you look at Bayer, mm. you know, the biggest uh, German uh, chemical company, they were very successful, a blue chip company in all portfolios for decades, right? Then they bought Monsanto, which of course is, um, you know, very agriculture focused, uh, pesticides, GMO seeds and so forth. And they thought this is a fantastic combination of these two companies and it will be very uh, valuable to the future of the business success. They paid uh, 68 billion for it. And the stock exchange was not at all of that opinion. In fact, 
buyer's value collapsed so that the combined value of buyer and Monsanto fell underneath the purchase price of Monsanto. It was the biggest destruction of corporate value in the history of the German stock exchange. What happened there? Why, why did that happen? Right? This wasn't uh, philosophically motivated. This was motivated by a long-term perspective that reflected in prices right now. Because this way of doing agriculture is the agriculture of the past. It's not going to be successful in the future because we need a regenerative agriculture that is very productive, more productive than our conventional agriculture at the moment. And that is already happening around the world. We now have regenerative agriculture methodologies that are much more productive than chemical-based conventional agriculture. And the German stock market was able to project that into the future and to say, um, not a good idea. So, so in, in the case of Bayer, it's the market that determined, gave it the valuation yeah. that they did and suggested this is not a smart move. Uh, lots of Sri Lankan companies uh, access capital from global markets, both yeah. equity largely and sometimes debt. Uh, and, and these funds usually come from large pools, some, sometimes uh, insurance money, sometimes people's savings and sometimes from sovereign wealth funds. Uh, in your experience, Walter, the, has the outlook of those managers who are managing these portfolios on behalf of uh, the wealth, on behalf of these clients, changed over the last, you know, five years or so in a measurable way? And, and we are trying to address how Sri Lankan companies might approach uh, ESG or environmental, social yeah. and governance issues here? I, I think that, uh, yes, it is measurable. So as I said, when I started helping to create this movement over 30 years ago, it was very small. Mm. It was called socially responsible investing, sure. right? right? Now it is $40 trillion. So this is very measurable. Sure. Now, it's not the majority of the market. And as I said, you can still invest in very carbon heavy industries, for example, and make very good short term investment money. But I also gave you the example of Bayer, where you can lose this money in a surprising way, because I think most people were not expecting this market outcome, sure. right? And this is the thing about markets, right? Markets look always into the future and they adapt the future value to the current situation, mm. right? So for example, I talked about coal. Mm. Now you can say buyer is Germany, it's Western markets, modern markets and so forth. But I just uh, talked with uh, friends of mine in Brazil where I do a lot of work. They have a publicly traded Brazilian energy company. And this company had also two coal power um, energy uh, companies. And they produced a lot of cash. They were very profitable. Nevertheless, they decided to sell these companies, these two coal companies, because they had mostly uh, renewable energy from solar, from wind, from hydrogen, and so forth, and from, for hydropower and so forth. When they sold these uh, coal power plants, their stock market went up very strongly, right? In a certain way, in a traditional analysis, you would say, why? Because they just gave away a cash cow, mm. right? Sure. That could produce a lot of cash for the coming years. In the short term, though. But the market was taking, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, making an arbitrage between the short term benefit and the long term benefit mm. and chose. So I think this is very important. And so and this brings us back to this question that you asked me before about shareholder value, right? So buyer, big destruction of shareholder value, selling coal companies, very positive for the shareholder value. What other stakeholders are important? We talked about clients, right? But we also need to talk about talent, right? So the most scarce part of the business is really good talent, right? It's true around the world. I mean, there's a shortage of talent wherever you go. And 
then you have to look at what are younger generations, including yours and even younger people, what do they want? And when you ask them, these people that come from MBA or engineering or other highly qualified uh, professional trainings and, and programs, they all want more sustainability. They want more purpose. They still want to make a good salary. They still want success for them and their family, but they also want to make a positive contribution to the world. In fact, BCG, the global consulting company, measured that uh, they have a 300% preference for more sustainable companies. Now, maybe in Sri Lanka, this trend has not yet as fully arrived. But in Brazil, for example, it has fully arrived. So in the past, my friends that run uh, investment banks there said, you know, when we had jobs open, people would stand around the block to do an interview for the job. Now we have to pay them incentives so that they even apply at all because they want to make a positive contribution to the economy, to the society in a way that they can really feel proud working for this company, right? I give you another numbers because you wanted uh, numbers, sure. right? So Unilever uh, shifted very much its brand impression, its, its international image, right? So uh, they are now seen as a company that is more sustainable. It's not perfectly sustainable, but is moving in that direction of sustainability regeneration. So the former CEO Paul Polman was the person driving that. Exactly. And before that already other partners of mine who were running the, the leadership department there and were kind of setting the ground into which Paul then came. Paul was a good friend. And uh, Paul then uh, had a big struggle against uh, Kraft Heinz, hmm. right? So Kraft Heinz was run in a much more traditional way, just shareholder value, reduced costs, no care so much about social and environmental issues. And Paul said, no, we want to move towards this new integrated way of doing business that also includes sustainability. And for a while, the numbers were better for Kraft Heinz. Right. But then the long-term trends hit and Kraft Heinz collapsed and Unilever went up. And now you have every year 2 million people applying to work there. Wow. 2 million people for maybe 10,000 jobs. Sure. Right? So this gives you an incredible competitive advantage because mm -hmm. you can choose for the some thousand jobs that you have from this big pool, right? So that is a, a number, again, that expresses this, what we call regenerative value creation. You, you integrate the regeneration of people and, uh, and society and nature and climate with business success. And this is an expression of that. Um, take another number, SAP, Germany's largest software company, right? And sells the software all around all the world. Right. Now, they started to measure the relationship of the satisfaction of their staff to their profitability. And they found out that when their culture index went up 1%, their profit went up 60 million. Suddenly, it wasn't anymore the assistant of the assistant who was doing the cultural survey. It was the CFO talking with the Financial Times in London about this phenomenon, sure. right? So what I'm saying is we are in a shift. We are in a time between paradigms. And in a time between paradigms, it can be confusing because on the one hand, you have the success of coal. And on the other hand, you have the success of uh, that we just described with SAP and, and uh, Unilever and so forth. So it's not black and white. As a CEO today, you need to learn of how to navigate this very complex situation and find both uh, what I would say very pragmatic transition into a more fundamental transformation. As you were talking, I was just checking on some of the facts you mentioned. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, buyer bought 
purchased Monsanto for $63 billion in 2018 and today Bayer is worth $50 billion. You, you talk about a, a shift in thinking that, that isn't uh, fully absorbed everywhere. Yeah. Right? Uh, if, it, if, if it is still challenging, when you started 30 years ago, what gave you the conviction that you were onto something? Because it couldn't have been, it, it must have been so much more worse 30 years ago to, to believe what you believe right now. So I think it, it helped uh, that I grew up uh, in Germany uh, and we had a very strong awareness of, uh, you know, our uh, Second World War history, the Holocaust, all of these terrible things that human beings can do. And with that came a very strong sense of responsibility. And also I was part of a company, an old family company that's now over 140 years old in Southeast Asia. It's an industrial group of companies where we are connected with companies like Siemens and Carrier and Merck and others around the world. And so when I um, was coming into a leadership position there, I wanted to translate this sense of responsibility into our company. Sure. And I think one of the reasons why we were so successful as a company for so long was that we were very respectful guests in the countries that we were working in because we were Germans. And uh, even though my brother has a Thai citizenship and his children are born in Thailand and, and Thai citizens and so forth. We, you know, I think wanted to and did uh, behave quite well and, and could translate that into the social activities of the company. But it was harder to do that environmentally because the products that we were selling were produced and designed in Germany or America or other international markets. So I realized if I want to make my company uh, sustainable, I have to be influencing markets around the world, especially in the countries where the design of these products is being done. So I actually uh, left the leadership of the companies to my brother and I myself focused on creating these movements in uh, North America and then South America also, and throughout Europe, Western Europe, and then Eastern Europe was also opening up and bringing together the companies around those regions that already were successful because they were more sustainable. So I give you, um, uh, you know, examples like, for example, the body shop that you maybe know, right? Um, they were later bought by a Brazilian company called Natura. Natura was a, a purpose-driven startup. They were doing beauty products. And now, 40 years later, there are one of the five largest uh, beauty groups in the world. They bought the body shop, they bought uh, Avon, they bought Aesop, and together they have this scale. And they are an example of how, from the beginning, they were very passionate to bring in social environmental values, but that didn't mean that they did compromise on business success. Sure. They became more successful, in fact, when you go to Brazil and you ask Brazilians about Natura, even the people who don't use the product are proud that such a company exists in the country. They have the best brand value reputation of any company um, in their market. Right? So what I did is I brought together all these companies from all these different countries around the world that were successful because they were more socially and environmentally responsible. That translated into real corporate value, into the motivation of staff, motivation of clients, motivation of uh, investors, better relationship to regulators and the state, and, and together all serving all of these stakeholders, not only for a moral or ethical reason, became a real reason for the business success also, right? Yeah. So when you see that around the world with hundreds and hundreds of companies, that they are successful like that, it gives you a clear understanding that this is a new way to do business. And I think 
because of the trends I was talking about, it's the future way of business success. We're not talking about just being philosophically nice. We're talking about what makes you successful in the future. Uh, you talked about your time leading the family business, which your brother now runs, right? And, and Germany has this rich heritage of family-run businesses that yes. dominate a large part of the economy. There's a word for that. Uh, Mittelstand. Mittelstand. It's a difficult what it word. means, middle is the center. It's it what makes the, the, I mean, first of all, it has to do with size, right? Because these companies tend to be smaller than the huge multinationals. Sure. But they're not small. I mean, they're billions of, of turnover. But they are also, in a way, the backbone of the German economy. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, if you draw parallels with Sri Lanka, I think in, in some sense there is something common there because Sri Lanka has a lot of family businesses. Even the fairly, there are large. many large companies that are still family owned. Even, and even the companies that represent big brands are owned by families, right? Does that create the environment to make sensitivity? or the alignment around those issues that you talked about, environmental, social, and even governance, easier, you think, or, uh, to, to achieve in a country where a large portion of the economy is controlled by yeah. families. Yeah. What, what's the logic there? I think that, um, you know, uh, shortly employed CEOs have a tendency to look at the short term and to maximize the financial success of the company and to maximize their bonus and to not necessarily think about the long term because in the long term they're working somewhere else. Sure. Family-owned companies need to be successful in the short term, but they also think about their children, their children's children, and they think about, I think, not only maximizing short-term financial success, but long-term economic success, right? So if you build, for example, short-term financial success at the cost of the reputation of the company, then you are maybe short-term having good dividends, but long-term, the value of the company is less because the value of the company is also um, how it is respected in the country. Also, for you as a family, like myself, right? You want to be respected as a family. If you do harm to the economy, maybe you get away with it for some years, mm. but eventually society is waking up and it is waking up very fast right now. And you don't want to have your family name associated with bad business practices. You want that uh, the country, like with Natura, and, and your family can be really proud of this business. Sure. And, and so you are looking at the longer term, you're looking at creating a kind of value that is a value for you economically as a family, but also a value to the society. And we now need to also take into consideration nature, because 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 100 years ago, nobody thought about nature that much. It was abundant, you know? There was clean air everywhere, there was clean water, the climate was fine, you know. In a way, people didn't need to think about it. I mean, in retrospect, it would have been great if we had been thinking about it. But now, climate is in front of our faces, right? So now we need to consider that, and also we need to consider it if you want to maintain a good reputation for your company and your family. Uh, Walter, you have deep connections with Asia. You talked about uh, your family business having deep connections in Thailand and yeah. the supply chain in the region. Uh, you also have connections with Sri Lanka. Yes. Can you tell us what endears you to Sri Lanka, what connects you to Sri Lanka and uh, a bit more? Yes. Well, I was very honored uh, to meet uh, Dr. A.T. Ariadne, the founder of uh, Savodia. Uh, I think about maybe 15 or 20 years ago, I was uh, hosting a big conference in uh, New York. I was on the board of an organization there. Uh, I remember Al Gore was speaking and we had 5,000 people there, so it was very busy. And there was this very energetic a man in a sarong and a white traditional shirt came to me and said, Walter, I want you to help us take Savodia into the 21st century. 
I read your books and I heard you speak and I need you to come to Sri Lanka. <laughs> so I said, okay, I mean, he was very convincing as he can be. And um, so, I don't know, maybe a month later on my way to Thailand, I, uh, I came to Sri Lanka and then I arrived and, uh, you know, he picked me up at the airport and on the way back to uh, Moratua, at the headquarters of Savodia, he said to me, oh, and by the way, for tomorrow, I have invited for the next four days, 250 leaders of my organization, <laughs> and you are running a strategy a <laughs> workshop for them to help us see what are we going to do for the next years. So <laughs> this is how I was <laughs> recruited <laughs> and uh, dropped in. And, uh, you know, and since then, we have been working closely together and um, of course, uh, you know, uh, helping to not only develop Savodia, but also Savodia Development Finance, uh, you know, which under the great leadership of uh, Chana uh, became such a successful uh, microfinance uh, institution that, uh, you know, now also financially supports Savodia's social and environmental and uh, other good works. Uh, so it was a great honor and a great pleasure and this was my introduction to uh, Sri Lanka. Walter, this has been a great chat. Anything you think you need to add to round it off? Uh, I think next July uh, we are going to um, uh, organize what we call a Future Economy Forum, which we are doing around the world. Uh, here in uh, Sri Lanka we are just still looking at the dates, um, but basically uh, it is uh, to bring together Sri Lankan business leaders and finance leaders and policy leaders um, and other stakeholders uh, together with representatives from around the world to look at what is the future of the economy here in Sri Lanka and around the world. How are they related? Because you are a very export-oriented country also and you are a tourism country, so the interface uh, between the Sri Lankan economy and the global economy are very strong. And also to make uh, you know, very clear what we call solutions initiatives. Mm -hmm. So you really see then how can you translate that into reality. Mm -hmm. right? Regenerative agriculture is the best solution for our climate crisis. Because you basically have two solutions for the climate crisis. One is energy, right? energy efficiency, reduce the need for use of energy, and alternative uh, regenerative uh, energy production through so sun, and wind, and so forth. The other is regenerative agriculture. So the two together, if we really put them large scale, we can solve our climate crisis. And, uh, you know, Sri Lanka could play a very important role in the global situation if it was introducing regenerative agriculture at scale in a way that's better for farmers, better for consumers, better for the nature, better for the climate. So it's very rare actually to find solutions that are good for everybody, right? So, and this is also something very important to consider. Um, if we look for solutions, the real solutions are helping every stakeholder. It's the same as with the good solution for success in the economy or in business. If you have a really good solution, it serves all stakeholders, whether it's in agriculture or industry or tourism or other things. So this is what we need to look for. Solutions that do what I call a regenerative value creation. Right? You create value for all stakeholders because you regenerate. That means also for investors, also for shareholders, they also benefit, but everybody then can benefit. Walter Link, this has been a really insightful conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me.